Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Laura Kleine, Secretary for the Amazing Earth Fest here in Kanab, Utah. Thank you for joining us today for our event, which is an audience, audience discussion on the documentary film, Fairy Tales of Growth with filmmaker, Pierre smith Kana. If you are new to Amazing Earth Fest, welcome. If you're returning, we hope you are finding our transition to the virtual format enjoyable. Our 14th annual Amazing Earth Fest is different from previous years. Rather than hosting group hikes, in-person gatherings, and workshops, we've invited participants to engage in our events online with platforms such as Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, and others. If you've not already looked at our website, we encourage you to do so. There, are a, there you will find an in, information about the history of Amazing Earth Fest, bios on its board members, and information on how to make a donation to support the organization. Additionally, you may click on events and view and explore our previous year's events. In the past, we've had in-person fundraising events such as silent auctions and bake sales to fundraise for our organization, but due to COVID, that too has changed. Please consider making a donation to our nonprofit organization to help support the work that we do to create this annual festival for your learning enjoyment. It will be much appreciated. Now, Amazing Earth Fest founder, Rich Senj, will tell you about today's presentation. Hey everyone, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us and um, uh, for those who might be watching this and recorded uh, session, uh, we're glad that you uh, took an interest in this really important topic of uh, not just climate change, but uh, um, the, really the future survivability and happiness of people around the world. Um, Pierre, um, I wanted to thank you for graciously agreeing to be with us today. Uh, Pierre smith Connor is the filmmaker who created Fairy Tales of Growth. And, um, and, and in the film, you, you might recall, uh, Pierre explores a, a range of myths um, that are pretty popular, widely subscribed, but, uh, but really untrue and misleading uh, around the climate issue. And um, so those myths include things like, you know, decoupling growth from energy. Uh, how do you do that, you know, and, and why is that necessary? Um, energy efficiency uh, and its relationship to consumption. Um, transition from fossil fuels to renewables, uh, it's not that simple. Um, energy demand, carbon capture and storage. Um, and, and this really pr provocative one, uh, measuring uh, public satisfaction and happiness uh, uh, through economic measures such as GDP. I mean, it's, it's just really kind of way outdated. Um, and, and Pierre explores that in the film, I think very, very effectively. So questions around degrowth and uh, personal happiness are, are paramount uh, for young people today. And, um, and I think this film uh, really very well addresses those, those issues and, and demonstrates uh, youth and uh, interest in a real earthquake level shift in the way governments look at um, managing popula their populations. So Pierre, I wanted to ask you if you could talk a little bit about uh, your career in documentaries, um, you know, what may you might have done before this in documentary filmmaking and maybe where you might go next afterwards. And also uh, talk a little bit about, if you would, the inspiration for creating this film. And welcome to Amazing Earth Fest. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, well, I mean, Fairy Tales of Growth is in fact my first feature film. So, I had experience before that, mainly in photography and making short videos on various topics, but I had never really ventured into making a feature film before. 
Um, so it was quite new terrain to me. So I have to do the whole process from beginning to end, um, including editing it and doing the sound and the color and everything. Um, Previous to that, yeah, I, I kind of um, really enjoy photography. And my mother is also a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker. So she helped me <laughs> along this process to, to produce um, this film. And the inspiration really came from learning about degrowth a few years ago. And then starting, I went to a summer school about degrowth here in Barcelona, where I discovered that they were doing a master's, starting a master's program in degrowth. So I decided to move here and take the masters. And it was a very interesting masters that not, not only covered very interesting topics, but also um, kind of proposed as a final project. You didn't have to write a, tra a traditional thesis. You could do a, your own personal project um, mm. as a final piece. That's why I thought, great, I don't want to write a thesis. <laughs> Another one. <laughs> so why not do something creative? And I thought something that was missing from degrowth is that if you're not, if you don't know about it and are involved in it, a lot of what is produced on degrowth is like academic articles, um, yeah. which are very good. Mm -hmm. And there are some great books that have just been released about degrowth, and some of them are very accessible. But yeah, it's still kind of very wordy stuff. Um, so I thought, why not make a film that can kind of transmit the ideas um, behind degrowth to a broader audience, you know? So that was really the inspiration for the film. At the same time, whilst I was living in Barcelona, I got very involved in the environmental activist scene here, which was very vibrant. And just when I moved here in 2018, the Fridays for Futures was just kicking off. Um, so I started participating in that here in Barcelona and the, there was a really nice group, very critical and very aware group of young people in Barcelona who were kind of spearheading the Fridays for Futures movement here. And I started filming them. So in fact, Maria, um, the young girl in the film, um, I was going to make a film kind of about her and about Fridays for Futures and degrowth. And it's only later that I realized a filmmaker who saw my first kind of cut was like, yeah, you have two films going on here. You know, you have one about Fridays for Futures, another one about degrowth. So you need to pick one. Um, so I decided, okay, let's keep it to degrowth still managing to keep this aspect of Maria and also this, this element of youth activism, no? which I think is very powerful and very important for us making any progress in this kind of uh, direction of changing things on a very deep systematic level. Um, I think the, the energy of the youth is super necessary for that. And I think they have a, a very legitimate voice in that, no? And they're saying, well, if you guys are screwing up the planet, it's, you might not have to deal with those consequences, but we will. So um, I'm glad that I could keep um, that part in the film. And in terms of future projects, well, I would very much like to continue in this direction of producing audiovisual materials on these topics. There are a lot of things that were not in the film that I would have liked to include, um, but for the sake of time, I couldn't cover them. So things like direct democracy, the role of direct democracy and more involvement in decision-making processes to do with the environment would be really interesting to, to do something about that. Equally, I have all this material that I have filmed of Fridays for Futures in Barcelona, so I could uh, make a film about them and see how they've continued from, from 2018 till today. And, and yeah, it's... Um, there are many ideas, but it's about getting funding <laughs> to yeah. be able to, to pursue them. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. Does anyone have any questions for uh, Pierre or something that came to mind? Um, I thought that film was fantastic or incredible I don't I mean it I don't it was amazing and um I just watched it uh, right before the this and I'm gonna watch it again probably two more times <laughs> because there's a lot in there that I I need to you know go back but I, I really I love the format and the progression and um 
a lot of times um, films don't leave you in a sort of a place that um, so you know so solutions are being looked at um, or viable solutions, but I felt like this one covered the, you know, we're, we're th th at least it exposed, you know, the, the lip service solutions that are being thrown out there that are really not, you know, the, the unproven solutions that everybody's, you know, using the lingo, but they're not proven. I mean, I learned a lot and, um, and I had not heard the term degrowth but I, it's, but I know it. I mean, it, in my, you know, in my life, I, I, that's kind of how I choose to live <laughs> um, as much as I can. And um, so it, I, I'm glad there's a term, you know, there's terminology for it. Um, and I'm wondering how, who's getting to see your film? You know, I appreciate that rich, um, and Laura brought this film to Earthfest, or I would not have come across it. So, who who is promoting it? Who's getting to see it? And um, I'm going to tell everybody I know about it. So, so yeah, how how's that working out? How, how's mm. it getting out there? Uh, well, first, thank you for your feedback on the film. Glad you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, in terms of the diffusion of the film, I guess uh, people in degrowth and the degrowth circles um, have been promoting it for me, you know, have been sharing it. So a lot of people in degrowth already have seen it and have shared it. Um, and, but yeah, the point of the film is for it to get out of these circles where it's preaching to the converted. You know? um, and in that sense, well, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we sent out a press release and basically didn't have much reaction from the mainstream press. Um, three different papers covered it without me knowing. So they wrote, people found the film by themselves and wrote a, a review about it, which was great. Um, and then, yeah, like somehow people have found it. I don't, I mean, I don't, it would be interesting to know how Rich and Laura found it. <laughs> and, then, and then contacted me to, to ask me if they could screen it or do a talk. So I've had places like universities in India, in Saudi Arabia, in the UK have, have somehow come across it and, and contacted me uh, to give talks, which has been great. Um, and recently, I've kind of, in the last few months, been sending it off to film festivals to um, get it more into that arena. And so far, it's had a good reception. We've been accepted by four festivals and um, there are another 10 to go so let's see if they they also accept it um but yeah i think it's kind of difficult <laughs> while supplying for film festivals i realize how many films are released every year there are tons of movies so it's also i also understand that you know it's it's just one drop in the ocean so it's hard for for it to to surface in a way um and in that sense, I think the, the only way for it to move is word of mouth, you know? I think that's the, the way for it to, to go around. And I suppose, yeah, as you said, degrowth is not something that many people know about. So, I mean, that's why I think it's a good title as well, no kind of playing on Greta Thunberg's speech. Um, so to try to give it more of a, an appeal to, to people interested in the environment in general. And, and yeah, but yeah, it would be nice to have a PR team <laughs> to, <laughs> to focus just on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. Um, I, I'd like to ask a question. Um, I really enjoyed the film as well. I would do want to watch it again, just because there was so much to absorb. Um, and I, like Sandy, I had never heard the term degrowth. And I just want to know what your feeling is about the concept of degrowth in the United States, because I personally don't see it. Yeah. Um, poof. I mean, I can't really give you a clear answer because I don't live in the States. Right. But <laughs> there, there is a group actually called Degrowth US that's um, based in the States. and. Um, 
kind of talking about these ideas. There are several quite prominent figures in the degrowth movement who are based in the States at the moment. Um, actually, the degrowth US group are having a talk on degrowth on December 6th. So if you're interested in knowing more, you could join that talk. I could find the link to that and, and share it with you guys. Um, I mean, my feeling is in the States, degrowth is not big at all, probably far less than in Europe, because degrowth originally came in Europe. You know, it was born in, as an idea in France and is still quite prominent in France. And then now in Barcelona and Spain, it's also quite prominent. A lot of the degrowth um, academics are based in, in Barcelona. So there's quite a strong group here. And then there's also quite a strong group in Vienna and also in, in Sweden and in the UK as well. So the US in comparison, I think is quite uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, much less, <laughs> much fewer people. Um, but equally, I think is it's a very challenging idea for the US who are in a way the kind of epitome of the growth consumerist model. So degrowth really represents a huge threat <laughs> to, to the US as a, as a culture, um, which for me makes it even more important for it to be pushed even stronger in the US because if the US, if this movement became more prominent in the States, it would, I think, have a bigger impact um, globally. So that would be fantastic to see that. Um, but yeah, at the moment, it's quite low key, I guess. You know, Pierre, um, here in the States, um, the, the ideas around degrowth may be uh, extremely threatening to consumerism and corporate America, and of course, our politicians who are um, so closely aligned with corporate America, but uh, there is a movement uh, emerging around consuming experiences rather than stuff. And instead of buying stuff and looking for happiness from that, which is a total dead end, um, people are, young people, of course, are, are particularly uh, gaining their, uh, it, there's momentum around this idea of of, uh, of living for experiences, and I wondered if that's something that is you know well established over there where you are, because uh, I think it's still emerging here. What What do you mean by experiences? Well, I, you know, I don't know. Um, uh, it would be an, an individual's choice, but. Um, instead of buying stuff that's shipped over in cargo containers from wherever it's made, um, people would use their money to visit, to meet new people, to engage with others, to do community service, um, to, uh, to, to be good parents, um, to, be in nature. To, to have experiences in nature um to, to go to restaurants and stuff and and visit with uh, their me members of their community spend their money in ways other than buying stuff mm. and and just stacking it up um and and i think america is really badly misguided in that regard we our big box stores and all this stuff is just full of junk that we accumulate mm. Uh, so that's sort of what I'm what I'm thinking about is other ways of of measuring happiness. I think that in your film you had uh, one gal on there talking about that, and and uh, that's a really provocative concept to just toss out the GDP and the economic measures and look at public health, look at um, personal satisfaction look at peace of mind, um, look at various psychological factors. Um, right now in the US, um, you may recall, I don't know if you got into the weeds with our, our uh, presidential uh, 
uh, campaign, the, the, the Democrats that were running, but one of them wanted to do um, a guaranteed annual income, um, Andrew Yang. And he spoke about that quite a lot and it got quite a lot of press. And the idea there is, uh, goes directly to um, some of these other measures of, of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess there's a distinction between um, spending, like experiencing different things, no, and spending more time with your family and friends and in nature um, as an experience that enriches your life. And then paying, in a sense, to consume these experiences. But I think that can also be twisted in a, in a very consumerist corporate way of saying buy this experience and then you can put it share on instagram and you're going to be super cool which plays into the same stupid kind of psychological traps that um advertising catches us with no so i think that there's a kind of this critique of degrowth against consumerism full stop you know like why do you need to keep spending your money on stuff whether it's physical stuff or you know, less physical stuff, because even the less physical stuff involves um, material at the end of the day, you know, um, even if it's to mm. go to a, a natural park, you're still driving there, you know, or taking a plane to go to another state or whatever. So I think the real kind of question is how can we live, you know, good, healthy and fruitful lives whilst being in balance with the environment. Um, and I don't think it's too complicated to do that. Um, and a lot of people live like that today, you know, in the global South, they have a tiny carbon footprint <laughs> and, and they have very good high levels of, of well-being in, in many of the places. Mm -hmm. now, Costa Rica is a super example that is used a lot in degrowth where it's like they have a very small carbon footprint and they have very high levels of well-being and, and life satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So I think it's possible at the level of a country to do that. But I think that, yeah, the big question is how do we get away from this constant pressure to try to be something or look like you are someone um, like, like wearing these masks, you know, playing these charades the whole time when ultimately it doesn't make us happy, you know? So what is it that drives us and our happiness? Um, are very basic things of spending quality time with your loved ones and being out in nature and doing those things doesn't require a huge amount of stuff or material or even money to do. Um, yeah. So I have a question here from uh, Josh. His audio is not working well. If we put a cap on GDP growth and at the same time help exploited Southern countries catch up, do we have any idea of what the average GDP per capita would look like in an evenly distributed GDP world? GDP aside, are there any better human welfare metrics that you know of that can measure success with considering GDP would drop in the Northern countries? Mm -hmm. Very specific question. <laughs> yeah. Um... <laughs> Wow, in terms of putting a cap on GDP and what the GDP per capita would be, um, I don't know. I'm not sure that's even been calculated. There's been a recent um, paper, which wasn't about GDP, but about material, I think, and energy. And it was looking at what would be a degrowth future scenario um, that would keep us within planetary boundaries. And so they calculated the energy, what would be a, a kind of threshold limit energy cap, you know, per capita. And, you know, shows that most of the countries in the world are currently way beyond that cap. But if they were below this threshold, then we would have actually enough energy to be able to have a normal life in terms of the energy requirements for accommodation, food, transport, uh, education, healthcare, and leisure. So, in a way, if you if you think about, I, I I mean I don't know where your question about GDP comes from, but I guess it's related to you know what would a uh, our daily normal lives look like if everybody lived within this uh, sustainable threshold. So 
I think that paper on energy, it's not on GDP, but it's on energy, but it basically argues for this, no? that a degrowth future would, be, would mean um, relatively normal lives for everybody. Um, and yeah, it was, they released it kind of as an argument to uh, a lot of people who react to degrowth thinking, oh, degrowth is like going back to living like cavemen. <laughs> and, and nobody wants that. And that was like an easy, cheap uh, jab against degrowth, and many people do, but that's not what degrowth is really advocating for. Um, so yeah, this paper kind of defends that position. Um, and then in terms of other indicators, there, there are several. I don't know if for me they are adequate, <laughs> but they're certainly better than GDP. There's one called the uh, GPI, which is the General Progress Index or General Progress Indicator, which mm -hmm. takes in other social um, uh, indicators into, into account. And then there's the, uh, in Bhutan, they've developed the Gross National Happiness Index. <laughs> they, they did this a long time ago, like 20 years ago or more where the king of Bhutan said, GDP is ridiculous. You know, we don't want to measure our progress with GDP. So we're going to try to measure the happiness of our, of our people. Um, so that's another one. And I think the, that the gross happiness index was developed with quite prominent um, economists uh, like Amartya Sen from India and Martin Nussbaum. So those, those are the two main ones. There are probably more uh, but those are the two kind of main ones that are being bandied around. Um, and then at the moment, there's this kind of new initiative that I covered very briefly in the film called the Wellbeing Alliance um, in Scotland with Nicola Sturgeon, Iceland's president and New Zealand's president, Jacinda Ardern. They are kind of pushing for this new um, way of modeling and running their, their countries, you know? So I think last year, New Zealand came out with a, a new budget the budget for 2019 was based on well-being, you know? So all the indicators that they had there for the government to focus and improve, hardly, I don't think any of them were to do with the economy. Maybe one of them was to do with the economy and the other five were all to do with health, with indigenous peoples, with um, access to education, with child like violence against children or something. Um, so I think that for me is quite a promising initiative to see that several leading, I mean, the presidents or prime ministers of nations are kind of advocating this other path. That's very promising. And I think now with the whole coronavirus situation, I feel that a lot more people are gonna be supporting those initiatives because, well, I think most people realized during this pandemic was who the hell cares about the economy? You no, know, the priority <laughs> is health, right? people's health. Um, and the people working in the healthcare sector, they're the real indispensable people that, you know, that we have to support, not the banks and the corporate sector, you know? So I think it's a very challenging and pivotal time right now with this pandemic that has kind of developed this awareness about what are priorities for people. And maybe the environment actually is no longer a priority actually, but now it's health of human beings, no? Okay, fine, we have health of human beings as a top priority. Um, and maybe the, the link that has to be made is, well, health of human beings relies on the health of the planet. You know, that's maybe where we need to start kind of reinforcing that message to, to develop, you know, to start moving in that trajectory on this, on this different pathway. Um, but yeah, it's like this, this crisis that we're in, you know, crisis comes from the Greek word of opportunity. I think I can't remember exactly what it, it is, but it's basically opportunity. So how do we seize this opportunity knowing that when it happened in 2008, you know, who were the, the best and the first to seize the opportunity were the banks and the corporate sector. Um, and it's already happening now. So it's like, how do we not get the government to bail out these huge airline companies, for instance, like France has done. Um, how do we, all the recovery funds, COVID recovery money, how does that money go to where we want it to go and not simply go to bailing out things that are deemed too big to fail? Um, I think that's a big challenge. But, but yeah, I think it's, a, it's an exciting moment because it's a moment where we can change things, you know? 
Thank you very much for that. Oh, Kara, I was going to ask you, um, in working with the others who were featured in the film, uh, if you could talk a little bit about it, uh, you know, any, and I'm sure there are many notable personal contacts you made with, uh, with individuals, but uh, the, the spectrum of activism that your film shows uh, is particularly strong as the film comes to a close with that wonderful music uh, at the end. And, uh, and so you see, uh, you know, the, the streets filled with people, uh, presumably uh, out um, demonstrating on some aspect of climate change, but is that right? Or was it, were some, some of those demonstrations really around uh, growth and, um, uh, how, how the uh, the society needs needs to evolve beyond measuring happiness by how much it grows, or maybe they're just interconnected. In yeah, I mean, so several of them would definitely uh, to do with the environment, you know, uh, environmental marches, um, either Fridays for Futures or Extinction Rebellion. Um, or the Sunrise Movement in the States. That, that last shot of the huge crowd in the massive street that was here in Barcelona, the last huge climate march that we had, which had, a, I don't know, 200,000 people. I don't know, it was very, very big. Mm -hmm. um, and then there were a lot of other um, protests. I mean, some from Standing Rock in the States and also a lot of protests against extractivism. Mm -hmm. So whether that's, in Africa, in Asia, or in South America, um, protests against extractivism, which are like environmental justice protests that, you know, um, mining companies coming into local communities and just kicking them out and polluting their water source or destroying their forest. Um, so a lot of environmental justice protests and equally protests um, against neoliberalism in general, mainly. <laughs> That's my dog. He's <laughs> Hello, welcome. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of a lot of protests in Latin America are very much geared against neoliberalism and against this perceived invasion. You know, a kind of continuation of colonialism through through business. Um, where they, it was especially strong in Chile last year. So, and the idea of kind of mixing all of these together, because I mean, basically none of them were directly degrowth protests. You know, maybe there are two clips, very short clips that are specifically degrowth movements. Um, but other than that, they're all this kind of huge variety of different protests. And the point is kind of that they're all connected somehow. I think Al Noor speaks about that at some point in the film where he's saying, you know, the media kind of wants us to believe that these are all disparate protests happening in different parts of the world, but actually they're all very much connected because they're all, even if they're not saying it explicitly, they are all in some way fighting against this hegemonic model of capitalism or of growth or of neoliberalism, however you want to call it, but this kind of hegemonic way of running the world, which is, you know, steal minerals and stuff here, transform them into things, and then big corporations in wealthy countries sell them for a profit. Mm -hmm. and, and that model just doesn't work. And it doesn't work for many reasons because screwing up the planet and also because it's, it's not benefiting the majority, you know, kind of the trickle down economics thing, it's not working. Um, not, you know, the majority of people who work even within these corporations or these businesses are not benefiting from the prof huge profits that they're making and wealth is just concentrating into the hands of the few. So there are like two huge arguments for why this model should be abolished and changed, you know, that it's inequality is accruing and the environment is being destroyed. So mm -hmm. all these movements in some sense touch upon that. And I guess it's the challenge you know, of our times of how do we 
drawing these movements together and build alliances. I think it's a lot about alliance building um, and being open to not just thinking degrowth is the only thing and everything else is secondary and we need everybody to say that we're degrowth. That kind of counterproductive, no? And same thing if a feminist says feminism is the most important thing and everything else is secondary. I think, in fact, a lot of these movements have many, ha have the same values and the same principles at the bottom of it. So I think that's what has to be built on is recognizing that we have those shared values and principles and how do we build alliances based on that to have a sort of unified block, a counter hegemonical block to oppose the, the dominant model. Well said. Mm -hmm. So is there anyone else here that had a question that hasn't yet been able to speak that would like to ask? And we had a few people come a little bit later. And if you're interested, press unmute or raise your hand and I'll help you. Yeah, I pressed unmute. All right, Sharon. Yeah, I, first of all, I'd like to apologize because I haven't watched the film because I didn't know what time it was. I was expecting to watch it now. But anyway, so I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but I, I'll say something anyway, but particularly related to everything that's just been said. Um, I feel like the, the really key thing is how we relate to the planet Earth and nature. And that um, I think sometimes when we're simply relating to, I mean, relating to other human beings is important too. But if we, we, we tend very easily as a species to kind of shift our priorities almost instantly to, to the human race and nature gets left over there somewhere. Uh, and this whole principle of degrowth is, of course, is the opposite of that. It, 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 by necessity, it involves a greater respect and caring for nature, because that kind of goes along with it. But I think where we as a species went astray was a few thousand years ago. And increasingly, as times have gone on, we haven't kind of evolved, we've kind of devolved. And, and nature is less and less and less important. And we feel we have a right to exploit it and destroy it. And, and this, that's kind of the nature of capitalism too. Um, and, and we can find something different in certain cultures in the world and in these modern movements that you've just been describing. Um, particularly, in, I mean, I visited India many times and there's a kind of, basic, if you go into the traditions of India, there's a basic kind of reverence for nature, which is kind of built in. It's just there. Um, and it, you can find that in every culture. And that's what we need to go back to. Uh, we need to go back to that because that's the way we're going to be able to bring about degrowth. Um, just saying to people, well, use less and do less. And, you know, obviously that's not, that's not a really good selling point. Um, but to, to bring back a respect and a love for nature is really the essential thing uh, because we're not above nature, we're part of nature. And, and when we can see that, then that, that can transform everything. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree less. Yeah, anyway, thank you for, for doing your film and I will watch it. I, <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I'm very sorry, I haven't watched it yet, but thank you. Thank you for doing yeah, it. No, but it's, it's very interesting what you say because I think when I was making the film, it was also, um, I had to also think about how to frame it. Mm -hmm. And um, degrowth is something that it has, it's very, it has many layers to it and it encompasses many, many, many different things. Um, and one of which is this, no, like um, our connection with nature and living closer to nature and living with the cycles. And it, in that sense, it, it shares a lot of things with permaculture principles and uh, different community grassroots based and communities. But I was also very much aware of the possibility for it to be um, lost, for the film to be lost in the kind of little hippie sector, you know? And so I decided it was a conscious decision not to focus on that 
and to focus instead on the more kind of scientific and historical arguments that Deleuze puts forward, which draws from, um, you know, political ecology and ecological economics, um, that, which for me is a very strong argument because they argue against the kind of mainstream view of environmentalism, the mainstream idea of sustainability, um, green growth, etc. For me, it was a, I prefer to focus on this to try to reach an audience that I wouldn't reach if I focused it too much on these other themes, which are equally important, you know, but there was the risk of it just being categorized as, oh, it's another film about hippie communes. Um, but mm -hmm. in fact, it's super important and both are important. Um, yeah. But one, one thing I would add is that, so um, degrowth was also very inspired by the field of ecological economics and they have a very nice kind of um, drawing of how the economy works. And it's like you have traditional economists say that the economy is like this circle and within this circle, you have everything. You have society, you have families, you have businesses, you have everything is within the bubble of the economy. That's how traditional economics perceives um, the world. Whereas ecological economics says, well, the economy is a circle around which is society and around which is the planet, you know? So the economy is actually embedded within society, which is embedded within the planet. And it makes it much, much clearer of <laughs> um, what is our position and what is the position of the economy? It's not a primary thing that can keep growing forever. No, it's actually limited and bound within um, the kind of physical limits of our, of our planet. And I think that is perhaps a kind of very, um, abstract way of, of seeing it, but for me, it's very connected to what you said about our relationship with this planet. You know, what is our relationship with with this planet? And of course, if you live in a city in a huge apartment building, where your connection to nature is restricted to a walk to the park, that's very different to if you live in in the mountains. And your traditional history tells you that this mountain has a name and is a living being. You know, if someone comes and starts mining that mountain, you're gonna feel that very differently and say, hey, you're hurting this being, you No. Know? Mm. So in that sense, I think a lot of it comes down to education as well, you know, and kind of reappropriating traditions that are not only indigenous traditions. I think there are also indigenous traditions within our cultures, you no, know, in terms of as a European, for instance, that there are very, you know, hundreds of years ago, there were Europeans who lived very much like indigenous people continue to live today in some parts of the world. So how do we reappropriate that knowledge and that wisdom and, and make it ours and live it and feel it? I think that's a big challenge, you know, how mm -hmm. to do that when educational systems are so uh, phew, terrible <laughs> and, you know, don't, they don't care about any of that. So that's a big question, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Sharon, and, and thanks for that response, Pierre. You, you know, one, one other thing, I, I, you're, you're absolutely right to focus on the economy because the economy, if we don't even acknowledge sometimes that that, that really is the heart of the problem, uh, is, is the way that we relate to the economy. And um, that's what causes, uh, you were talking about the, the coal mines and the oil wells and the extractivism. Um, I mean, all that is economically, the whole thing is economically, the whole thing is economically driven. I mean, that really is the essence of the problem. So you're absolutely right. You know? We don't even see it. it. It kind of comes, it's kind of embedded in the way we go about our lives is, is um, the economical factors. Pierre, um, we're about uh, 10 minutes to one here, our time. Um, I wanted to ask you if you have traveled into the global south or other non-G8 countries, uh, you know, gotten out of the developed world and into the under undeveloped countries much and in making the film or just in 
research or actual visits? Um, did like uh, maybe talk a little bit about your understanding of satisfaction in the so-called undeveloped nations? Because you alluded that satisfaction is quite high, and I think that's that's right from all that I've learned. Yeah. read um, I've had the opportunity to travel a little bit but not a lot yeah I mean in the making of the film no I, I was basically stuck in Barcelona and <laughs> and no actually that's not true I was in Barcelona and in London and then also in Colombia my partner is Colombian and uh, whilst I was making the film I also went to Colombia um, and which reminded me a lot of India, actually. My, so my grandfather is Indian. So I've traveled to India um, a number of times. And, and yeah, I would say that has influenced my perception of what is the global south and how people live in the global south. Um, I've also traveled in Latin America several times. And yeah, it kind of makes you think, it kind of makes it reflect because it's so radically different to what we know in the West in terms of everything, in terms of their culture and their traditions and their um, physical environments. It's very different. And it, it does make you reflect on, well, you know, with all of our wealth that we have, our so-called wealth, are we really that much happier or that much better off? than them, and I, and I don't think we are, and I think they are much better off than we are in many, many ways, um, especially, I think, in terms of the community ties that they have. I think community is much stronger um, in the countries that I've been to, at least. Um, but nevertheless, there is still this huge pressure that they feel of developing and emulating the model that they are sold on television and in advertisements. Um, that come from the States and from Europe. And I think that's that's a problem. And it's also a challenge um, because I don't think that I'm in a position either to go and tell them, hey, don't follow us because we're making a mistake. You should do this. You know, that's not really my position to tell them what to do. Um, but I think what, I mean, it was interesting. I had a talk. There was a, a university in India that invited me for a talk that we gave on, on Zoom a few weeks ago. And yeah, it was a very interesting talk because the students there are all Indian students and they've never heard about degrowth and degrowth is clearly a proposition, a proposal that comes from the global north that doesn't apply to the global, global south that tries to explain the, the relationships between the two. And, and they were kind of like saying, well, what, what is degrowth for us? You know, like, what does that mean to us? Because we still need to develop, which is true, you know, like they, countries of the global south have, have a right to development. Um, but I would hope that they choose a different path, you know, and that they can, in a sense, lead us. <laughs> Showing us, here's a different way to do it, um, which many of them are already doing. There are many countries in the global south that already have incredible uh, philosophies and ways of living that are very much in harmony with with well-being and with um, sustainability. Um, in Latin America, there are many, Buen Vivir, for example, is one. In Africa, Ubuntu, which means you are, therefore I am. You know, it's a very deep philosophy of, of life. Um, in India, they have a thing called Eco, Eco Swaraj. Swaraj was the principle that Gandhi lived by of self-sufficiency, you know, to be uh, self-sufficient and not, not rely on the British. And so Eco Swaraj is the idea of well being self sufficient and sustainable at the same time. And there are many um, communities that live like this and that are democratic and take all their decisions democratically as a community. Um, so there, there are tons of examples of, um, of these kind of ways of living that we could aspire to, us in the North. Um, but they are always in competition with what's on the advertising panel, you know? Um, and, and yeah, that's a, that's a challenge that I don't know 
I mean, some countries, some cities have uh, banned advertising, for instance, uh, which I think is a first step <laughs> that everybody should just do and just ban advertising um, because it's, uh, it's a very toxic, it's a very toxic industry, um, mm -hmm. especially for children, if you think about, you know, raising your kids. I don't want to raise my kids in the city. <laughs> Yeah, I would rather raise them in the countryside where they don't, they're not exposed to all these things. Yeah, yeah I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, very much so. Thank you for that. We, we did have the, the privilege of visiting Venezuela and some of the Caribbean nations and places in Asia, uh, some of the island nations and, and Southeast Asia. Um, and we could see readily, and this was back in the 80s, uh, people, common people, seemed much happier than Americans. <laughs> and so it's kind of an awakening to, to get out of the first world and experience the so-called third world. Yeah. I mean, I think it's also important to, to note, you know, that uh, wealth in, in monetary terms does contribute to well-being up to a certain point you know like right. we can't just say you know nobody needs money no like we do need a, a certain basic amount of money to be able to provide food and shelter and healthcare and the kind of basic necessities but it's after that after this threshold that perhaps many countries in the south are not even at that threshold yet you know there's still tremendous amounts of poverty in the global south so we can't just say oh they're happy no like they they also you know there, there has to be uh, maybe they already have enough money it's just not distributed correctly i don't know but the, there definitely is a threshold that everybody um ought to be at as a matter of uh, human right um but beyond that it's, it's the beyond that that's the problem and that's specifically for us in the global north that we're way beyond that um mm. yeah Well said. Um, among uh, those on the call, are there any other thoughts you'd like to share? Um, we're at uh, just about coming up to a full hour in our discussion. It's been fascinating, really interesting and, and um, informative. Uh, raising awareness is key principle of our festival, Amazing Earth Fest. Um, we want to offer people experiences and opportunities for personal growth and connecting with nature and uh, and this film uh, meets the the that criterion so well no i don't think anyone else has questions <laughs> okay we think so well, Pierre, uh, thank you so very much for taking the time out of your evening over there uh, in Barcelona to be with us. And um, we'll promote the recorded version of our conversation and make sure to get that out to our wider audience uh, best we can. And um, continue your good work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. I'm really grateful that you invited me and really glad that you enjoyed the film. I just sent a message in the chat um, about the degrowth uh, meeting happening in December by the degrowth USA group. Um, so if you're interested in knowing more, they're, they're a very nice group. Um, you can f find more information about the, the meeting on Twitter. Um, so I don't know if you have Twitter. I had to make one myself for the film. <laughs> I wasn't on it before, but it's actually, it's pretty cool. So it is quite, quite useful. And you get very interesting news and information there that you would not otherwise get. So I'll be sure to mention that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, so the film and me, we're also on Twitter. If you have Twitter, I want to follow. We'll right. definitely get this information and add it to our follow-up emails. Yeah, super. Let people know. Okay. Super.
Super. Okay, everyone. Thank you again for attending. And this concludes the 14th annual Amazing Earth Fest 2020, where we had uh, a range of maybe 23 or 24 activities um, spread out over uh, a number of months to keep everyone safe from the virus and, and yet give us opportunities for discovery and, and sharing. So thank you very much for attending. And uh, hope to see you again in the future. And Pierre, uh, maybe we'll have a, another opportunity to uh, promote your film and we'll, we'll do that and let you know if, uh, how that goes. Thank you very much, Rich. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Bye. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Your night. <laughs>